Hi, and welcome to this video in which I briefly explain how you can use a new spreadsheet to monitor fitness and fatigue or changes in performance of an individual athlete or patient. From my experience, a lot of coaches, trainers, and physiotherapists like to use the spreadsheet to monitor performance of their athletes or patients and to make objective decisions based on the change in performance, but I don't know how to use the spreadsheet. Therefore, in this video, I will briefly explain how you can use the spreadsheet. I should note that I'm no expert in statistics, but rather a sports scientist, athlete, and strength conditioning specialist who, who is interested in bridging the gap between science and practice. So the spreadsheet is made by Professor Will Hopkins and can be used for the following purposes. It can be used to determine how likely it is that your athlete or patient has changed performance on a measurement since the previous measurement. For example, it can be used to determine how likely it is that the jump height or one repetition maximum back squat performance of your athlete or patient has substantially changed since the previous test. Secondly, it can also be used to estimate the deviation of one measurement or the average of several measurements from a linear trend line. In this way, you can determine whether an athlete performs worse than normal and thus whether he or she is fatigued. Additionally, you can determine the effect of an intervention, such as caffeine supplementation, on performance compared to the athlete's or patient's normal performance. So essentially, you can do a case study with your athlete or patient using this spreadsheet. And finally, you can also use the spreadsheet to determine uh, whether your athlete or patient is progressing fast enough for a specific long-term goal you have set. For example, if your goal is that the patient improves his 10 repetition maximum back squat by 50 kilo over the course of five weeks, this spreadsheet can calculate whether the patient is progressing faster, slower, or as expected. So you can find the spreadsheet and an article that contains additional information for the spreadsheet on the website sportsci.org. So it's the website I'm, website I'm showing here. You can click here to download the Excel spreadsheet, and you can click here to see the article, which is this article. So you can scroll down, and the article contains additional information about the spreadsheet. So if you click on this link, the spreadsheet will open. So I already have it here. So this is the spreadsheet, and it looks perhaps quite complicated, but don't let it scare you. I will explain everything in most ways uh, and in a way that is hopefully understandable for practitioners. So first, here we have some instructions on how to use the spreadsheet. It's all this text. Here's some more instructions. And if you look at some cells that are red triangles, and if you hover your cursor over the triangle, it will pop up a small uh, additional file with instructions. And I strongly advise that you read these comments, all the comments and the comments in the triangles before you start using the spreadsheet. So I will walk you through the spreadsheet in a few steps. I will first explain what you have to fill in into the spreadsheet to get the results. And in the second video, I will explain how to interpret the results. But that's actually quite straightforward. So if you have decided which test you want to use to monitor performance or changes in performance, you first have to put the test scores into the spreadsheet. So you can do this in this row. So you can see here test scores, and here you can put in all of your test scores. So for this video, I will use a hypothetical jump height score from a physical education student measured once every week for 20 weeks, as an example. So I have 20 weeks, and I measured him once every week. So if you look at the numbers, you can see that there is an improvement for the student in jump height over time from here's 37, 39, 40, 42, uh, 44 centimeters. So you can see here also in the figure when it's plotted, the red dots are jump height. And in general, there's an improvement in jump height for this individual. And don't worry about all the arrow bars and all the other stuff. I will explain this later. Um, you can see here a row for time. And you can fill here in like the number for your test or just a date at which you have conducted the test. Um, so again, don't worry about all the other numbers. I will explain them later. And if you want to use the spreadsheet for multiple individuals, or if you have multiple tests for the same individual, then put every new individual or new test into a new tab. So you can make a new tab and just copy paste the whole spreadsheet into a new tab. 
So once you have filled in your uh, test scores and a date or a number for your test, we have to put in some other stuff to make the spreadsheet work. So first we have to put in a typical error, which we can do here. Uh, now it gets a little bit more complicated, but don't worry, I will walk you through step by step. So if your test measures something in centimeters, the typical error you provide here has also to be in centimeter. If your test is in kilo, this also has to be in kilo. Uh, you can also put in here the typical error as a percentage. So you may wonder what a typical error is. Well, the typical error is also known as the within subject standard deviation, and it provides information about the random variability that an individual shows when a test is repeated. An example of this variability is a volleyball player that performs five trials of a vertical jump with two minutes of rest between the trials and jumps 40, 42, 41, 43, and 42 centimeters. Another example is someone that performs a back squat with a few days of rest between attempts and squats 75 kilo, 80 kilo, and 78 kilo. Even though both individuals have not made a substantial change due to training between the repeated trials, the scores show some random variability. A statistic that captures this random variability of an individual's values on repeated testing is the typical error. You can calculate the typical error yourself based on the test scores of repeated testing of your own athlete or patient, or you can get it from a scientific study that uses participants that are comparable to your athletes or patients. Before I show you how to get the typical error for a study, I want to briefly explain why we need the typical error in the first place. So you need the typical error because you want to be sure that the change in performance is larger than the random variability of your athlete. If the change is in, in performance is similar in magnitude to the random variability, then you can't be sure if the athlete or patient has really improved or whether it's just random variability. So Will Hopkins has suggested that a change of about one, one and a half till two times the typical error is likely a real change. So uh, now I will show you how to use the typical error value from a scientific study. So if you click on the link below the video, you will get to my website. So I will open the website. It's here. So on my website, I've put a table which shows the typical error derived from studies from some commonly used physical performance tests in a specific group of subjects. For example, you can see here that for a counter movement jump measured by a uh, jump math in physical education students, the typical error is one centimeter or 2.8 percent, which means that an individual score with this with this test in this group of subject typically varies by one centimeter. You can also use uh, you can also search for this information in all articles that have used the tests you are using with participants that are comparable to your athlete or patient. So just look for the typical error or within subject standard deviation in this article if you don't find your test with the groups of subjects that you are using in this table. Since my example individual is a physical education student who has performed multiple counter movement jumps, I decided to use the typical error, uh, this typical error to put into the spreadsheet, which I have done here. So you can see one centimeter is my typical error. I've put it in here. So you can also see here, you need to provide some information about the degrees of freedom which can be calculated as the number of tests multiplied by the number of participants, minus one. For example, if you or the study you, you use has done three repeated tests, so for example, three vertical jumps with nine participants, then the degrees of freedom is three multiplied by eight, and eight, not nine, because we usually need one less than the number of change scores. So that will be 24 degrees of freedom. So in the study I want to use for the typical error, they had 93 subjects with three trials. So the degrees of freedom would be 92 multiplied by three is 276 degrees of freedom. So if you go back to my website, you see here there's also a column with degrees of freedom, 276. So I've put this number into the degrees of freedom uh, cell here. So now I've put in both the typical error and the degrees of freedom into the spreadsheet. I should note that you can actually use the spreadsheet without providing a typical error. And in this case, the spreadsheet will estimate the typical error based on your test scores. 
but this usually uh, results in an overestimation and makes the statistical inference unclear. Furthermore, you will need a minimum of approximately 10 test results to get a reasonable uh, approximation of the typical error. So putting in a typical error is preferable. So the next thing we have to fill in is the smallest worldwide change. Sometimes the typical error can be very small and a change that is larger than the typical error is in this case not necessarily practically relevant. Or in other words, it does not have an impact on sports performance, health or risk of injury. For most tests, however, the typical error will be large and a change that is practically relevant will be smaller than the typical error. Therefore, in the spreadsheet, you also have to put in a value for a smallest worldwide change. And there are two ways to calculate this. And this differs between team sports and individual athletes. So for team sports players, there is no direct connection between a change in a measure of performance and the chance of winning more games or getting less injuries. For example, faster sprinting has only an indirect contribution to performance in football, and the higher jump height has only an indirect contribution to performance in volleyball. For team sports players, the smallest worldwide change can therefore be calculated using standardization. And in this way, this is, uh, this is a special formula for this, and it's 0.2 multiplied by the between subject standard deviation. You can also calculate this yourself or get it from a scientific study. And I will provide an example of a scientific study again. So if we go back to the table on my website, you can see here there's another uh, row where I have put in the smallest worldwide change for that specific test. So you can see here that the smallest worldwide change for the kind of movement jump for the physical education students is 0.9 centimeter. So the individuals in the study had a mean jump height of 35.3 centimeter with a between subject standard deviation of 4.5 centimeter. The smallest worldwide change is then 0.2 multiplied by 4.5 is 0.9 centimeter. So the smallest worldwide change is in this case 0.9 centimeter. Or in other words, the smallest improvement in kind of movement jump height that is thought to be relevant for this individual is 0.9 centimeter. So if I will go back to the spreadsheet, I have put in 0.9 as the smallest worldwide change. You can also put in the smallest worldwide change as a percentage here. So for athletes that participate in individual events, such as 100 meter sprints, the long jump, javelin throw, the smallest worldwide change can be calculated as 0.3 multiplied by the variability that top athletes show from competition to competition. So it's another way of calculating the smallest worldwide change. I won't go into detail on why and how to get this smallest worldwide change in the video. Some more information on the smallest worldwide change for these athletes and also for the standardization approach can be found on the website of Will Hopkins. So it's again sportsci.org. And it will be in the second link below the video. So there's something else in the spreadsheet. Here we can put in a smallest important trend. For example, in this case, my goal with this individual is to improve vertical jump height by two centimeters in 20 weeks. So the weeks here should be in the same units as your measurements. So if you have here daily measurements, then this should be also like how, how many units do you want to improve per days. Or if you have one measurement every month, then this should be in months. So now we have put in the test scores. We have put in the typical error. We have put in degrees of freedom, the smallest important change, the smallest important trend line. And in the next video, I will show you how to interpret the results then of the spreadsheet.